afternoon and welcome uh, to Holly Springs this afternoon for this meeting. I'm Donnie Siegel, I'm the pastor here at Holly Springs. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Kevin Corbin, our senator, uh, approached me about hosting this meeting and it didn't take me to about two seconds to say absolutely. I think we all recognize just how important, how vital uh, high-speed internet broadband is to us here in Western North Carolina. So it's our honor today as a church to be able to host this uh, at no charge. Uh, to be able to, to host this today. Uh, by the way, a couple, of, a couple of housekeeping matters. We have cookies, coffee, and water in the back. And to go along with that, restrooms are in the front. Uh, ladies on this side and men's on this side. I um, hope you enjoy this time together today. It's my privilege to introduce to you uh, Senator Kevin Corbin, who is not only my senator, my, my good friend. Uh, he and his family and extended family are active members here at Holly Springs and have been for a long time. Um, Kevin has, I can't think of a, uh, another political leader in our state who's done more for his constituents over these last years than, than Senator Corbin. And it's my privilege to call him my friend and my senator. Senator Corbin, come and open us up. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Good. You guys good? Glad to be here? Sure. Thank you so much. We're glad to have this meeting. Uh, let you know that us, we in Western North Carolina, we're the first people to have a meeting like this. No other district like ours has had a meeting like this, so don't tell anybody that we've done this because they want to copy us. But uh, we, this started a few months ago. We began to talk about, uh, the, you guys remember the genesis of this thing where uh, Josh Dobson and I introduced a bill, uh, uh, the Great Grants, and from that came, came the, uh, or the uh, Fiber Act, came that, from that came the Great Grants, which have been about 10 million a year, 10 or 15 million which sounds like a lot of money, doesn't it? Sounds like a lot of money, that's statewide, which is nothing. So you guys know, you've read, you know that we, not have, we don't have 10 or 15 million, we put $350 million into the great grants. That combined with some uh, federal money is a lot. I'm not gonna tell you, I'm not gonna uh, uh, bust your bubble because Nate's gonna talk about all that. But just to say there's a lot more money. We've had some progress. We've gotten great grants in every county that you see here. We've gotten money. But it's been a small amount. And we've gotten hundreds of people hooked up. Hundreds. But we need thousands. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Thousands. Yeah. And it's a problem. And we know that. Uh, in, in my Senate district, and we've got about 210, 220,000 people. Roughly half those people uh, do not have high speed internet. And uh, Cindy Hobbs, where's Cindy? How many of those people that don't have internet have called our office? 100,000 of them. <laughs> so, if you, how many of you got a letter or an email or a phone call that invited you here today? You see, all right. That came from Cindy Hobbs in my office in Raleigh. She does a great job. Give Cindy a good hand for a lot of good work. We appreciate her very much. And also, uh, uh, Carl may mention this, but Carl Gillespie is, is my co-host uh, for this event. And uh, Carl is our representative. And there's Mike Clampett. Hey, Mike, I didn't know you were here. So, so uh, this, this is my Senate district, and I'm going to have to include uh, Transylvania County. So Woo! Transylvania, right there. I know where you are. If you're from Transylvania County, stand up. Glad to have these folks. They found out we were having this. They got a phone call and said, wait a minute, we're going to be in your Senate district. And I said, well, it may not be my Senate district. It's after the election, but we're going to include you in this. And so we are going to, I want you just to imagine, I didn't have time to draw it, but Transylvania County is right there. And I think that's a great spot. So we're talking about today everything west of Asheville, okay? I care about Asheville. I care about Charlotte. I care about Raleigh. But they're not my district. I don't care about them as far as whether they have internet or not. That's somebody else's concern. I'm concerned about everything west of Asheville. Can somebody say yes, amen right there? That's what we're here to talk about today is how we get this money that, that these guys are going to talk about. It's a lot of money. I'm not going to say the figure because it's so big. I had My phone won't even calculate that much money. So I had to do the math. But we need to make sure that we get our share of the money 
west of Asheville. Is that clear? Yes. Because every day, how many of you hear people say, well, my neighbor's got internet just across the street and I can't get it. My, my neighbor just across the next road's got internet, but I can't get it. How many of you have heard that from people? We hear it every single day. So we need to fix that problem best we can. And we've got money in the budget to do it. That's what's different. What's different about this? We have a lot of money. Instead of 10 or 15 million, we have a lot more than that that's in the budget. So with that said, at Transylvania County, if you're from Cherokee County, I want you to stand very quickly. Cherokee County. Let's welcome Cherokee County. If you're from Clay County, Clay County, we've got some folks from Clay. Thank you guys for being here. How about Graham, Graham County? Philippine, there we go. And Swain County. Swain? Back. Thank you guys. How about Macon County? If you're from Macon County, please stand. All right. And Jackson, Jackson County folks. Lots of those. Thank you guys. And Haywood County. Haywood. Thank you. Appreciate it. So everybody's at the table. If you're a provider, you're an internet provider, would you please stand? Just stand. We're going to recognize Carl's going to take that a little later. We have these folks here. If you represent a utility, Duke Power or otherwise, would you please stand? Utility folks. There we go. Any questions? Any questions about Dick Power? You talk to uh, talk Sir? to Lisa. Yes. Thank All right. You. <laughs> My mic seems to be dying. I will grab this one. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. All right. So without further ado, we've got uh, some great folks here today. We've got Nate Denny is the Deputy Secretary of the Division of Broadband and Digital Equity. Now, there'll be a test, you have to remember that, when we get done. But he's from Raleigh, and we enjoy getting these folks from Raleigh up here. Uh, and Nate understand, most of them down there think that, that, that Western North Carolina is Hickory. And I said, no, <laughs> Hickory is not in Western North Carolina. We, we consider Asheville close to Western North Carolina, right? This is Western North Carolina. And Nate understands that, and we appreciate that. Thank you for being up here and seeing where we live and listening to our concerns. Also, we have Angie Bailey. Angie's the Director of Broadband Infrastructure Office for North Carolina. Angie, would you stand uh, in Raleigh? Glad to have her. And we have Crystal Dickerson, who's the Communications Director for the Division of Broadband and Digital Equity. So we're glad to have her. So without further ado, what we're going to do, the first part of the program, uh, these folks are going to talk about uh, some very interesting things about the money we have, how that's being distributed, and all that. And then we're going to take questions, and then, you know, we'll, we'll take a short break, allow you to go to the restroom. We have refreshments, we have coffee, cookies, all those things in the back. Then we'll come back, and we're going to hear from the providers, and we're going to ask, uh, you can have questions of them. So without further ado, uh, with Nate Denny, we appreciate him very much for making the trip up from Raleigh. So welcome, Nate Denny. Thank you, Senator. I'm going to reattach this and get somebody from the State Department of Information Technology and then ask him to hook up a microphone. It's not going to go well. I'm going to not move with this. Thank you very much. Senator, thank you for having us out here. Uh, thanks to the rest of the team who came out. I also want to give a shout out to Keith Conover, who uh, works in the Broadband Infrastructure Office. Angie and I get to come talk about this stuff, but Keith is out there working with your communities. I'm sure he knows many of you here, yeah. building the relationships and putting in the work to build good, smart projects that connect Western North Carolina. So thank you, Keith. Good work. So there, are you all, can you all hear me all right? Yeah, I sound super loud to me. So, uh, a few things we wanted to achieve today. We want to quickly walk through uh, our work, talk about who we are, what we do, talk about why broadband is important, talk a little bit about what Western North Carolina looks like, and thank you, Senator, for making sure I knew which counties are Western North Carolina, uh, and then talk about all the different funding and uh, a little bit about our mapping efforts. So. I'll start off, and then I'd love Angie Bailey to come chime in as well and talk through some of the specifics. 
on the programs. So I think that the pandemic over the last couple of years has made it abundantly obvious how urgent this problem is, right? Uh, the ability to work from home, learn from home, right? Kids do school, access telemedicine services, apply for a job now, you gotta go online to do that, uh, access state or federal benefits. Uh, every walk of life now requires a high-speed internet connection, right? And uh, our goal now and our challenge is to close the digital divide in North Carolina once and for all. Our data suggests that more than 1.1 million North Carolinians are on the wrong side of that divide. A lot of them because they don't have access. Significant challenge out here, right? The absence of actual adequate infrastructure. Uh, a lot because they can't afford it, because they don't have a computer or even a smartphone at home, uh, or have the digital skills necessary to participate in the modern economy at all, right? And, and that's what we have to fix. And I'm going to talk a lot because there are very large numbers attached to the infrastructure problem, but we really got to keep the affordability piece and the digital literacy, the devices and skills piece in that conversation. Because I can run fiber through your front yard, but if you can't afford it, right, or you don't have a computer, what are you, you're still going to get left behind, right? And, and so that's the challenge that the governor and the General Assembly have laid out for us, address all of this problem, right? Um, and so to do that, you know that mission slide, thank you. Uh, the, we really got five major priorities. Expand access, right? Invest in the infrastructure. Um, you know, basically high-speed internet access today is a capital expenditure problem, right? Providers uh, make the investments up front to deploy fiber or whatever technology they're using, and they use the funds coming in from subscribers to pay back that investment, right? And in, particularly in rural areas, where subscribers are sparse, it's harder to make that, uh, make that money back, make that investment back. And the programs that uh, we in the General Assembly have designed and put together and funded in a huge way on infrastructure seek to change that math, right? And make it more attractive for providers to step into parts of the state that they haven't done previously. So that, that's one. Two, and this is a little inside baseball, but we want to build a team that can do this sustainably. And it's really important to balance in our work being expedient, right? We, we've got to get broadband yesterday, right? But we also have got to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars, right? We've been entrusted with more than a billion dollars of the people's money, and we need to make sure that we are using it to benefit the people of North Carolina. So uh, that's really important to us to, to maintain that element of stewardship as we make all of these investments. Um, we want to use data, we want to get better data, and we want to use it better. And I'll talk a little bit about this on the next slide, and then Angie and I'll both talk about it in terms of mapping, but we need a more granular view of who's got service and who doesn't. Who has something, but maybe not service as fast as they need in the future. And then again, who can afford it, right? Uh, uh, addressing that affordability and the device access question. We want more North Carolinians to be able to afford it. We want to build the skills to make sure folks have the devices they need. So those are the big organizational priorities. And how we're holding, holding ourselves accountable is by setting very clear metrics for success. We want to go to 98% of North Carolinians with using American Rescue Plan funds, the funds that, that for the billion dollar uh, program that we're executing right now, we want to get to 98% of North Carolina uh, households with access to a line. And you'll see up there that 95 is in quotes, and that gets back to that mapping thing. Right now, the way we figure out who has internet access is from FCC data, Federal Communications Commission. And they look, and I'm sure many of you already know this, so I'm, for, uh, I'm sorry for telling you something you already know, but uh, they look at the census block. And if even a single household in a census block has high-speed internet, they call the whole census block served. The result being, I heard someone chuckle, and that was the right reaction. Uh, the result being that uh, we have inflated numbers of who actually has service in North Carolina. So we need to go from fake 95% to real 98%, and that's one of our big challenges, getting that better data. We want to make sure 80% of North Carolinians subscribe, have a subscription to high-speed internet. We want to make sure that those 
uh, uh, improvements to subscription rates happen and benefit all different demographic groups across the state. Um, and we, I think most importantly of all, want 100% of North Carolina households with school children to have a subscription to high speed internet. We want to permanently close the homework gap as it's known in North Carolina. And so quickly we'll do a, a snapshot of Western North Carolina. And I'm not going to dive into this. I, hopefully Angie will get into way more detail than me on this. But here's a, a, a snapshot of the eight counties. And I think you've each got a handout with some of this data. But you can see the, the kind of hash mark areas with the diagonal lines are areas that are called unserved by the FCC today. We've also got several different layers of state and federal funding going into these areas. Uh, we've got the pink areas are what are called RDOF awards. That's an FCC program for the World Digital Opportunity Fund that uh, we can talk more about today. We've got several rounds of the great grants, as the program Senator Corbin mentioned. Uh, the, up to this point, a pretty small program uh, investing in rural last mile infrastructure that's had about 15 million year for the last four years. There are, uh, I think it's kind of a purple-ish color for uh, Rural Digital Opportunity Fund awards for terrestrial internet, so it's fiber deployment, anything uh, uh, on the ground as opposed to satellite. And then a handful of other small federal awards including the Department of Agriculture's ReConnect program. You can see, I think, on your handout the data we've got, such as it is, flaws and all, about who's got uh, high-speed internet service. And I, I try to say high-speed internet instead of broadband, because broadband gets technical. But what counts as broadband is internet service that is a speed of at least 25 megabits per second download and three megabits per second upload. That's a current federal definition. It's really dated. <laughs> and I think that's another thing we've learned from the pandemic when we try to shift everything remote. Everybody go home and do all the things you were doing, but on Zoom or Teams or something. And that's not going to cut it, right? Um, you know, I, I, my, uh, I've got two little girls, and one of the best advantages I had, and I live in a super, you know, in, a, in an urban county where multiple providers are competing to, to sell me fiber service, but I could go in the height of a pandemic and take them to a, uh, a pediatrician visit online, right, instead of sitting in a waiting room, right? You can't do that on 25 three speeds, right? So we've got to move beyond that old federal definition to get to what we call future-proof speeds. And for now, we're calling that 100 megabits per second download, 20 megabits per second upload. And you can see in that second column what the percentage of the population, based on our best math in flawed, what percentage of population has service at those speeds. And then tracking closely uh, to, to that number is what percentage of the population has access to fiber service. There are a lot of different technologies that, that can deliver high-speed internet. Um, what we see, well, the, the federal funding that the state is using to make these investments come with a, comes with a specific fiber preference, both in terms of speed, uh, minimums, and technology preference. And so that's what we're going to be talking about most through the course of these programs. For the internet providers who are in the room who may be a fixed wireless provider, we absolutely believe that fixed wireless is part of the problem, uh, part of the solution. Part of the solution. <laughs> <laughs> part of the solution. Uh, there are always going to be parts of the state that uh, we won't be able to deploy fiber quickly enough in, or fiber will be prohibitively costly, right? There are going to be areas where you need a downtown Wi-Fi project, or you need to build a telephone pipe, uh, a tower that a, the wireless provider can use to attach. So, and we've got a funding approach to do that, so I don't want to leave that out there, an important part of addressing rural communities across the state. And then there are several numbers here for subscription rates based on census data and population with a computer as well, just for your awareness, so you can see what we're doing so far to measure the problem and how we're seeking to improve it and hold ourselves accountable. So let me quickly run through the funding opportunities here. And uh, Senator Corbin graciously allowed me to talk about the really big numbers, so thank you. Um, the General Assembly appropriated in this budget 
and the governor directed $1.036 billion to solve this problem in North Carolina. And that comes from American Rescue Plan funds, federal stimulus funds in response to the pandemic. And so that's the first uh, uh, tranche of funding that I'll talk through. It's what we're operationalizing right now, and it's all laid out right here. On the next slide, I'll talk next about the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IIJA, which is a lot of fun to say out loud, um, which could result in another billion dollars of funding to fix this problem in North Carolina. So the, the good news is we could take care of this problem. We really have, and, and this will never happen again in terms of, of funding levels at, the, you know, at this height. Uh, we can solve this problem over the next five or six years in North Carolina, which is extremely exciting. The, uh, of the billion that came through this budget cycle, about 970 million of it goes into infrastructure programs designed, again, to make sure everyone has access to a connection. 350 million federal dollars on top of an existing state 30 million for the great grant program that Senator Corbin mentioned already. That program is one by which the internet providers come to us, work on an application to serve X number of households at Y speed, at Z cost per household, and so on and so forth. It's scored on about a dozen criteria. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it because counties can uh, uh, chip in as a matching partner on, the, on that uh, project. And again, it, the, the program has done about 15 million a year over the last four years connected over, I think, 45,000 households in North Carolina, or we're in the process of connecting 45,000 households in North Carolina. It's done good work, but as the Senator said, the problem is so much bigger than that, and finally we've got a funding level, I think, commensurate to the problem. Um, we've got a new funding approach that we're extremely excited about at the department called the Completing Access to Broadband Program. And that's going to allow the state and your communities to be much more proactive. No offense to the providers that are here uh, in the room, but we won't completely address this problem until counties and the state can work together, be strategic about it, proactively identify the areas that need to be served, and go directly out to the market, right? And create a competition. And so it'll be an RFP process that we're in the process of standing up right now uh, once we get this first round of great grant funding uh, launched. The, uh, the great grant, that $350 million round, opened January 30th. Applications are due April 4th. Uh, we think awards will probably come in June, which I'm not sure I'm supposed to say until live, Mike. Um, and, but that'll start to give us better data that will let us figure out where we need to make uh, these investments, how we need to prioritize counties that have areas left over, um, that weren't addressed by the Great Grant Program, and how we build the kind of procurement approach we're going to use to fix, uh, I think, a huge swath of, of the state. And, and I should mention, too, that that CAB program is a matching program, too, right? So counties can come to us and say, look, here's our understanding of uncertain areas. Here is the, the American Rescue Plan funding that we're prepared to chip in. We'll work together to, uh, to design an RFP, a request for proposals, and like I said, go out directly to the market. $400 million just from the state on top of what counties are willing to chip in, and the providers will chip in as a result of the competitive process. So it's going to make just a huge difference in terms of who, um, where there are projects and how many projects there are. We've got a $90 million stopgap solutions uh, bucket that is designed to encompass a broader range of uses beyond fiber, like, uh, like we talked about. This could be where fixed wireless projects uh, are funded in some, uh, in some areas where fiber is not immediately practical. It could be really high cost fiber deployments for a stretch of highway that might tank the rest of a competitive application because this one segment is so expensive. Uh, but it's really our most flexible and strategic pod uh, and, and we look forward to getting to that once again we've got more data in and have executed on our other programs. You'll hear a lot about how uh, utility poles, access to poles uh, is important for uh, for deploying fiber. We've got a hundred million dollar program just to reimburse communication providers that are upgrading their utility poles in service of a larger uh, broadband project. And then a million dollars for mapping. The, the, 
uh, the funds necessary to get kind of that household level of view of who's got not even 25 free service, who's got maybe up to 120, or who's got better, who's totally covered for the foreseeable future, uh, and how do affordability and device access figure into that, that map so that we can make more targeted investments. We've got $50 million for digital literacy uh, opportunities, community partnerships uh, around teaching more people how to use the internet, how to find a device, how to get into the, uh, the FCC's affordable connectivity program, which includes a $30 a month subsidy or benefit for internet service. Um, and so we'll try to make sure we're making smart investments to actually have a higher subscription rate across North Carolina as well. And then, again, we're doing all this work right now based on American Rescue Plans, knowing that the bipartisan infrastructure law has additional funding coming down. And we don't know what North Carolina's share of these funds will be yet, because they're formulas that have not been released to us yet. But fortunately, Congress decided that instead of making a big federal project on broadband, they're going to rely on us. They're gonna come through the state, they're gonna come through the counties, and through local communities to make bigger, better, locally based, locally designed projects, which we think will be much better for accountability and stewardship of the dollars and help serve more North Carolinians at the end of the day. Um, we're, we know we're gonna get a share of the $42 billion, uh, what we call BEAD program, that is designed to connect rural areas left behind. We know we're gonna get a share of a $1 billion middle mile pot, so that's the not the stuff that comes to your homes directly, but serves our major community anchor institutions and that your internet providers use to then get to your home, uh, as well as some additional uh, tribal funds and uh, for, for connectivity in tribal areas and uh, digital literacy programming as well that the state will either get a formula portion of or go compete for. So a significant amount of funding here um, coming to North Carolina between the American Rescue Plan work that uh, the governor and the General Assembly have already put in to try to address this problem and the additional federal funds coming to us soon. And with that, I'd love to ask Angie to come talk through particularly the uh, great grant project and or, or program and the CAB program, that county RFP process, and a little bit more about mapping too. Thank y'all. Hello, I'm going to try to stand over here and look at the slides this way. Um, um, before I start, um, so I'm Angie Bailey, I'm the Director of the Broadband Infrastructure Office at NCDIT. Um, I want to recognize everyone that's here. Well, thank you, Senator Corbin, again for having us and to Cindy for organizing everything. Um, but I do have to say that in my, so I've been working in this space for about 20 years, and the folks from this uh, part of the state really are, this really is the most active part of the state in terms of citizens and counties being engaged in broadband planning and broadband advocacy. Um, and so I just want to make sure that, and I don't say this to, you know, every region we speak to. Um, even, you know, 20 years ago when we worked with this part of the state, Southwestern Community College back then was just starting plans to develop middle mile. You all needed a lot more middle mile in the state back then, and um, that be eventually became the Balsam West Network. Um, so you're, the eight counties here and the Eastern Band of the Cherokee have been really dedicated to this issue for so many years. Um, and I think what's different now, and I, I wanted to recognize Keith again. Um, you know, he's worked for 10 years with counties here um, broadband planning. I think you all have more broadband committees than a lot of parts of the state. Um, but I think what's different now is that we've got this funding available. We've got the Southwest Commission, who's actually been, I think, our only regional council of government in the state that has actually helped administer um, and package great grant applications. Um, we've got a, more of a diversity of broadband providers in this part of the state. Um, I think we've had more successful fixed wireless projects in this part of the state. Um, we've got up some electric co-ops involved in projects. So there's a lot going on um, and a lot of opportunities. I think your geography's challenging, um, but uh, you know, having this funding available really changes the opportunity. So let's go through 
the funding pots. So Senator Corbin mentioned the Great Grant Program, which originally launched in 2018. It was a $10 million pilot, and then it became a $15 million state grant program. So the difference now is that there's a $350 million pot of federal funding attached to GREAT. Um, as Nate mentioned, we launched the program January 31st, um, and the application rounds uh, closes on April 4th. Um, and we have all of our program guidelines on our website, uh, which the link is up here. It's a bit long, but our website is ncbroadband.gov. Um, we've got FAQs posted. We did an information session a few weeks ago, or late January, well, uh, probably early February, um, going over all the grant rules. So that's all online. Next slide, please. Um, and so the applicants for the Great Grant Program are broadband providers. You have to be a broadband provider to receive funding. Um, the program specifically is to fund infrastructure and unserved locations. So unserved being locations, households or businesses that have speeds of less than 25 down, um, three megs up. Um, and so <clears throat> that's kind of outlined in the guidance document. The maximum grant, grant award is $4 million and we can award up to eight million in a county. So to be, we're curious to see what type of how many applications we're gonna receive. We've not had this level of funding before. We know our broadband provider partners are working hard to submit applications, and so we'll know in a couple weeks what has come in. Um, and counties are encouraged to participate in the Great Grant Program. They can be providers, uh, they can have partnerships with broadband providers and either contribute matching funds um, to the, the provider applicant or they can contribute um, infrastructure. Um, there are some technical rules around, uh, so a county can participate in GREAT and a county can participate in CAB, which is the Completing Access to Broadband Program. Um, if a county has spent their local American Rescue Plan dollars on broadband directly, and independently of the state programs, they are actually not eligible for grade and cap. And I think the thinking from our policymakers on that was probably that to encourage counties to participate with the state programs so that we can leverage that money and get more money out there. Um, so again, counties are encouraged to participate. You can either, um, if you have infrastructure or assets to contribute, that's one way to partner or a financial contribution. Um, and they do have, that does have a big impact on the scoring for the grant. So scoring, it is a competitive grant program. Um, there's a sliding point scale. Um, the highest the providers, the applicants with the highest scores are, you know, receive funding. We review all the applications and then we uh, verify the match requirements based on the score. And so I won't spend too much time on this. This is in our guidance document online. <clears throat> but essentially, you can get up to four points for having a partnership. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you get points for how many unserved households are in a project, um, how many, uh, how, I'm sorry, how many unserved households are in a county, and then how many unserved households will be served through the project, uh, how many unserved businesses will be served, the cost per household or business, and then there's a multiplier based on the speed that will be provided. Um, and then you can get additional points for having a community broadband playbook or for and, and additional points for having a county match. And again, I think this, this slide just kind of shows that, you know, we add up all the points, we add in the, the multiplier, which is really important as to what speeds are gonna be provided with the project. Um, the requirement is that the, the, based on the federal legislation that these projects must provide a minimum of 100 down, 20 up, and then they have to all be scalable to 100 symmetrical, and that's based on the federal guidelines. And the other thing that's in the federal guidelines that's really important, important is that the speeds have to be provided reliably. So the word reliably is in the federal legislation. And essentially it says that if you, whatever speed this, the provider says that they're gonna be providing has to be, um, you know, it can't be just certain times of day or, um, you know, it, it, it needs to be reliable. And so that's an important language that we didn't have before. 
And so the matching funds are determined by the application score. Um, up to 50% of the match can come from a, a um, third party. Um, the highest score receives the priority for funding. Um, the match has to go towards the same eligible costs of the project um, within the application. The county can use their ARPA funds or unrestricted general revenue funds. And essentially the match can be anywhere from 30 to 50% based on the score. But if a county puts in, I know it gets a little bit in the weeds, but, <laughs> but if a county puts in a share of their ARPA dollars, then the match automatically um, gets dropped to 25%. And if the county puts in all their ARPA dollars, the match gets dropped to 15%. So if you're talking about large projects, you know, this is a big, um, a big impact. And so I think you may be hearing from providers that are wanting you, if you all are with county governments, wanting you all to put in your ARPA dollars to get those match amounts um, lowered. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's the great program. Again, those applications are due April 4th, so we'll have a better idea in a couple weeks of what we're getting, what, what parts of the state we're getting applications from. Um, we do post the applications online. There's a 20-day protest period, um, and we can talk about that more when we talk about mapping. But essentially, if there's areas that are already receiving service, then that provider can protest locations. Um, but that is why we post all the applications online, and we'd be happy to share with you all, you know, what we've received in a few weeks when those come in. So that's great. We'll have a better idea about that in a couple weeks. The Completing Access to Broadband program called CAB is our new program. And essentially that's a partnership between North Carolina Department of IT and each county that wishes to participate. And we mutually identify eligible areas in the counties um, that would be eligible to be served, and then we would do an RFP jointly with the county to have uh, providers come in and build out infrastructure to the unserved and underserved areas. So um, we are working on that process now. Um, no, no county can receive more than $4 million in a fiscal year, um, <clears throat> and the award has to be county and state funds together. So the counties have to contribute if you want to um, participate in the CAB. Uh, and then the state actually provides the oversight of the project, so that's a, kind of a win for the county that, it, that we're the ones administering it and monitoring it. Um, and we are working to get the program developed and we'll have more information about that in April. So those are kind of our two big programs. I, th I think we don't have a slide for it. There's also a stopgap program, which Nate mentioned, which is $90 million. And that comes after kind of we know where great grants being built, we know where CAB is being built, and then there's another 90 million to fill in the gaps in between. So I think that's a really important pot because it's going to be a bit less restrictive than some of the other ones. <clears throat> and at the end of the day, you know, the key to all this is being able to identify where the locations are that are unserved or underserved because it's kind of a, the policy issue that is out there is that we can invest public dollars in areas that already have service and already, already have private sector investment. So it's getting down to, as Nate was mentioning with the mapping, getting down to where your areas really are, I mean, down to the exact locations. So that's what we really need in order to, especially for the cab, in order to get those build outs. Um, so as we get into CAB, mapping will be a huge component. It is with grade as well, but CAB will, will be even more so because we'll be working with each county individually. So online at nc1map.gov is our state GIS resource. Um, and so there is a great grant mapping tool, which our provider applicants are using to, um, they have to download address points to submit their great application. That's online if you want to take a look at that. There's also a broadband project planning map, which is essentially the same data as the Great Grant mapping tool. And it um, is a good way for the counties to start, communities to start looking at as that map that Nate showed or that's on your table. What areas do we know are unserved? What areas have other federal or state funding? Um, where are the art off awards? <coughs> and so some of that if you want to start digging into that, it's in that broad, uh, broadband project planning map. 
And then the NC Broadband Survey, that's our state survey that we've had out for a couple of years. But essentially it's a, um, a short survey for households and businesses and a speed test. And we encourage any households and businesses to please take it, um, report whether you have service or not. And then the speed test, you know, ideally, even if you have one meg down, if you take the speed test, that shows us that, that allows us to capture that speed. And that's real data that we can use um, in figuring out these unserved areas. So the speed test part is really important. If you don't have access at all, you can take it on your mobile phone, or there is also a, a phone number that you can call in and report uh, by voice if you don't have internet. And I think. Crystal has a few handouts that we've been using for outreach for the surveys, so if you all are interested in pushing them out. I do know that these that a lot of the counties here have done surveys in the past over the years. Um, I think the difference, what we would say with the NC Broadband survey is that it's all the same. You know, we, we really want a uniform survey across the state, and that's why we created that, and so we have the exact metrics for how it was put together and how to use that data <coughs> excuse me since we'll be actually determining what areas are eligible for funding so that's the nc broadband survey i think that's is there one more slide oh yeah okay and if you so if you have questions for the great grant program we have a special email great grant at nc.gov we're getting lots probably hundreds of questions coming in over the past couple months month and a half um and so we ask people to please send questions to that one mailbox so we can keep them all together, make sure we're answering them all, um, and posting them in our FAQ document. The CAB program, our email address is cabprogram at nc.gov. And again, we're trying to capture all the questions in one place so we can respond uh, and see what people are asking the most. Our website, again, is ncbroadband.gov, and we've got pages for the different programs. And then mapping questions, uh, if you could send those to broadband mapping at nc.gov, and those go straight to our GIS person. So that's kind of, and just to add before we turn it back to Nate, um, you know, we've had a lot of information sessions um, on grade. We've had some county sessions that are posted online. We've been working closely with School of Government and the Association of County Commissioners to try to help get information out. But we know it's a lot of information, so if you have ways that we can better reach you all, I'm working with the COGS, um, you know, please let us know, because we do want to get as much information out as we can um, to keep all aware of the opportunities. And Nate, I think we have one more. Thanks, Andrew. And well, hang up here, because I think that uh, the Senator can help do some Q&A or help uh, um, make us available, I guess. Uh, I don't know that the Senator knew that I was going to give his constituents homework, so I apologize. <laughs> but there are three things that we appreciate from you all. One, in your community, look, come to us, right? Reach out to us and, and start working together to uh, design these projects and figure out how we can put these funds to the best use. Uh, Angie and I have both given repeated shout outs to Keith because I think despite all the funding figures and everything, which is an incredible opportunity to make a huge difference across the state, but I think the work that we're proudest of that happens in our team is the work that's already been happening with folks like Keith going into your communities and helping uh, answer questions. It's not me, it's all of them. <laughs> Absolutely. But, but I think that's a valuable role to help and play a, you know, a, a, support, a minor supporting role in promoting this work and the work that you're doing. And, and that's really key. So please come to us and, and uh, let's get to work. Two, encourage residents to participate in that survey program that Angie just mentioned. We've got the, the great grant pro uh, process includes a protest. So an internet provider can say, uh, uh, after they see the publicly posted applications, they can say, look, this provider wants to serve this, these 100 households, but we serve these already. Don't, don't put public money there, which is a good thing to have. That's a good safeguard, right, of public funds. We've gotten thousands of survey responses in areas that the FCC says are already served, including areas that other providers are telling us 
they're already serving, so we shouldn't go there. Every one of those survey responses helps us make sure that more people are getting access to high-speed internet and that we, honestly, that your communities have more leverage with the provider community. So uh, please help us with that. Please uh, come to Crystal, wherever she is. Find Crystal, she's right there, and uh, uh, ask her about how you can help get word out about that survey, what the total, what the uh, number is to call in if you don't have high-speed internet. Huge help to us. And then last but not least, is help get into your communities, your constituents, word about the Affordable Connectivity Program. ACPbenefit.org is where you can go. Uh, uh, check that you've got an internet provider that's participating in that program and get $30 a month off your uh, internet cost if you are a qualified low-income household. It's hugely important if we're ever going to hit the kind of adoption numbers, the subscription numbers that we're trying to get. So please help us with all three of those. And other than that, turn it over to the Senator and be available to take questions. Thank you. Give these guys a nice hand for being here today. Thank you. Uh, we are right on time and what we're going to do is we're going to take a few questions. If you, let me say this, if you have specific questions uh, that would just pertain to you. Let me ask you just to get with them. And we have a very large crowd, and if everybody asks a, a specific question, we'll be here till uh, tomorrow sometime. But if you have a general question about what they presented, uh, please ask that now. Yes, sir. And if you would, when you stand, please state who you are and where you're from or who you're with or whatever, and direct your question to them. Thank you, Senator. Bill Shelato, River Street Networks, and my question is to uh, the Madam Director. The protest period uh, after the April 4th filing, does the incumbent or the protester have that full 20-day period? We haven't actually posted the exact details of the protest process, which we will be doing in the coming weeks. Um, it's a 20-day protest period, so yes, you have you will have the 20 days within when that application is posted um, only broadband providers that have service in that location are eligible to protest, which is different than past years. Will I be able to rebut if I get protested? We'd have to, we'll have to look at that, but yes, um, and those exact details of the protest period will be posted online Thank you. when we post the applications. And, and it's important to note that the burden is on that protesting provider to show us at a household level who's actually served and we can check, right? So that's actually one of the important uh, levers we have to get better data about who's served. Thank you. Can I add one? I'm yeah. sorry. And, and there is a new rule about, uh, there's a 10% rule that's been added in this year's legislation that um, essentially, I don't have the rule in front of me, but if you want to look online in our guidance document, essentially you can have uh, you, up to 10 percent of the locations can be served with, and no protest is allowed. You can't protest one or two households anymore, yeah. which you used to be able to do. All right. I got a question. Other question? Yes, sir. Ron Rudium, Macon County, just the president. Is there a component in your proposal process for small businesses, minority-owned businesses, a, a part of the contract that would be allowed for waived because of this basic? We don't have in the great grant and cap. Sorry, way closer. In the great grant and cab programs, the two the, the big ones that we've talked about here. The qualified, the, the eligible respondent or applicant is an internet provider, and there's no statutory authorization for us to go anything further than that. What we are trying to do is work directly with the provider community and figure out how they're hiring, how they're building projects, and uh, uh, encourage local participation, local employment opportunities, and inclusion of uh, uh, hub or minority-owned businesses in their own, as they build their projects. Great question. Right, uh, yes, sir, back here. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Dwight Hauser, and I'm living up in the Manhattan Lake area, and we've been well underserved. In fact, we don't even have local home service, landline service for a lot of our residents. We don't service either so there are a lot of emergencies that go under unanswered as a result of 
uh, our situation. But to get back to um, uh, my first question, y'all say you're going to be receiving additional funds through um, Uncle Sam. Will that have any federal ties to it, or will y'all be able to um, allocate that money uh, as you see fit? And will it go into all these programs, or will it fit into a certain program? Excellent question. Uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act funds go to the states uh, for us to basically submit a five-year strategic plan on how we're going to serve everybody in the state, bar none. Uh, so we'll have to put that plan together. We've already started drafting that plan. The, um, the um, what was the point I was going to make on that? Uh, as we get data in about our ARPA-funded programs, the Great Grant tab, we'll get a better view of which of those programs is most effective and actually helps the most people, and we'll drive additional federal funds into those programs. I think we've got ideas, competing ideas at times, about which of those programs will prove to be the most effective, but we're going to let the data drive where we make the investments. But they will go into state programs. Now, will the data that you get, will that be from individuals, will it be from providers, will it be from the county? What source will you use to make that determination? All of the above. I think the, the key data points for us will be uh, the, the results of our mapping project, right? The more granular view of who's got service, who's, got, who's underserved, they got something but not what they need, and who's uh, totally unserved. As we get that data in, we can make more targeted investments. But, but on top of that, we can also see what demand looks like, right? We can go through, you know, the great grant program with $350 million in it might have $500 million worth of applications. Might also have 100, right? So we'll have a sense based on the specific requirements for the program on what allows the providers to and encourages them to most thoroughly solve the problem, right? Same with the CAB program. As we do these county by county requests for proposals, we'll see what the market cycle says, right? And we'll know, because of our mapping efforts, what's left over and how we have to target them and what tools are most effective to do it. Uh, one last question, please, if you don't mind. Uh, you talked about the great grant and you talked about the CAB. Now, uh, one thing we haven't talked about is charge. And there seems to be some type of alignment where Charter and the county can partner together to uh, extend service to eligible, underserved, or unserved areas. Can you address that? I'm going to broaden it beyond Charter, and there may be folks from Charter in the room who can help respond. And I think the providers will have a chance to talk to you a little about, about their footprint, their work, and their expansion plans after we take a break. Um, the the partnership, and, and Angie touched on this both in the context of the Great Grant Program and that county program, CAB, you can partner with any provider that wants to serve, right? And, and in CAB, that's well, in both, Great and CAB, that'll go through a competitive process. So if Charter is the example here, right, the county can work directly with Charter as a potential Great Grant applicant or they can work with us, put out an RFP, maybe Charter or others will respond to that RFP. I hope that's helpful. And happy to talk more offline or off mic, off mic at least. All right, anybody else? Uh, and we'll probably need to take maybe one or two more questions, and then we're going to uh, break and come back, and we'll take more questions. I think I thought I saw this lady's hand next. Uh, Wendy Ward, I live in Pinkton County. Uh, my question is on these grants you're talking about. Um, the providers have to partner with the county. How do we how do we find out? Is there a designated representative or a position within a county that is responsible for that? How do we know who that is? And maybe the other counties would want to know that too. But I certainly would like to hear that from the county. I think that's a good question. So we sent out a survey a few weeks ago to every county. I believe about half the counties here have participated so far. We did ask for a designated contact on broadband, and I'm kind of wondering, I'm looking at Russ, <laughs> but I'm wondering if the Southwest Commission would be willing to kind of, if, if there is an, a designated um, person in each county to post that information, would that be a reasonable 
um, role. I mean, we can as well, but I think uh, that would be a more direct way. And, and between us and the commission, and I'm sure the senator's office, we can make sure folks who have been who have somehow gotten access to an invite have that information as a follow-up too. Yeah. Okay, let's have maybe one more. And yes, ma'am. My name is Wendy Navarez. Um, I was just curious uh, with these data points that it's on, it's the burden of the um, local government and the entity that's helping them uh, collaborate to provide those data points as addresses. What is the qualifying, like where's the threshold? How many, how many people have to be served in that um, yeah, so actually for the NC Broadband Survey, it's, it's households and businesses that respond directly. And it, it, there's no minimum. So if you say your household is unserved or underserved, that data point is on our public map. And that's available for broadband providers to access and see that, hey, this is an area that needs service. Does that make sense? I, you know, I understand what you're saying. Okay. But what, what I meant was we're qualifying for these different uh, options for funding. Um, what would be the qualifying So for the great grant program, it would be that a broadband pro provider would have to choose to submit an application for your area. Um, but counties could certainly reach out to them and encourage that, or towns or citizens. Um, and then for, for CAB, the county government has to tell us that they want to be an active partner. It is an actual legal partnership for the CAB program. Is there not like, uh, for example, 100,000 or 1,000? I mean, what is right. that yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a minimum threshold, but it is scored competitively, right? And so the great grant is scored on, I think, 12 different criteria or something like that. Of, of those, number of households or businesses served is one, or maybe there's number of households and separately number of businesses served. So the more the better. And I'd say in CAB, because we'll be working directly with the county to put on our fee, we'll try to tackle it all, right? Every, everything that we know of that's unserved or underserved. And, um, and just to say, it depends too on what's already there. So if you're, if there's five houses that are unserved, but they're right next to existing infrastructure, you know, those five might be included in a great application or a cap proposal. Or with the stopgap funding, there may be something like a line extension program to build out to individual homes. So it varies. I mean, it, but yeah, the more houses, um, you know, the more attractive that may be to a provider. And Angie mentioned something that I think we should acknowledge is a, a major problem, especially in remote, remote parts of the state. My parents just uh, retired outside of Weaverville, and she moved to Weaverville, and uh, talked to a number of providers about getting service, and there was fiber running down their highway, but to get up their driveway, a provider, and I will not name the provider, uh, uh, had said basically be seven thousand dollars just to get up to their house, right? On top of monthly charges and everything. So we know that's a big problem, and it's one that we hope to, as we get better and more specific data, start to be able to address. Okay, last question. Thank you, Senator. Uh, for the uh, secretary and the director, can you tell us the timeline for the new maps and your guess on how they, it's going to impact the county? Great question. Uh, so the well, I think we have a request for proposals that's going out to market for mapping in the next week or two. Hope in the next week or two uh, that will uh, allow respondents to help support this map. I think our goal is to have improved maps, and of course we've got these maps up and running already, but start to kind of zoom in uh, within four to six months, I think. And then so that will. There will be time for that to inform uh, CAB, uh, CAB RFPs and subsequent rounds of great grants if we come back for more. Of those. What do you think the impact on the counties are going to be for these new maps? What, what's your estimate? Well, I mean, it, you know, I, I think there will be a lot of impacts. I don't know if you're asking for a specific uh, figure, but you know, our goal. Look, there are some counties that are already doing mapping. And that, that's great. And if, you're, if your county is already mapping, if you've already done one of the surveys that Angie's talked about, we're gonna to work together and we're gonna to try to incorporate your data 
and we'll make our data available to the counties. But when we work together with the county in the CAB process to, to identify unserved areas or underserved areas and put out a procurement to address them, we're going to be bringing that improved data to the table. That's, that's it. Okay, one more quick thing. And I think you know, Bill, that the FCC process is changing. So the FCC has different parameters of what they're collecting. That data is due to them September 1st. So we're also looking at how that data collection, we're not, the, the challenge is we don't know how long the FCC will hold that data before they release it. Will it be a year? Will it be two months? So that's what we're looking at. But the providers and the data you all submit really important, an important piece of all this. So thank you. Thank you. Well, long story short, fill out the survey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He got it. Thank you. All right. This kid's been standing screaming in the back. One more last question, and then we'll tell you where we're going from here. State your name and your question. Sir. I have a quick question for the room. If you have a cell phone, please raise your hand. Okay. So that means that each and every one of us has a hotspot possibly on our phone. Yeah. My question to the state chief was, are there grant monies for the wireless telecommunication industry to come in, build out towers, and wirelessly satisfy the needs of broadband in West Coast Park? Because we run into issues with the geography here. The bedrock is really hard, so it's very cost prohibitive for telecommunication companies put in fiber they could dig where they have to pay and then we're dependent upon new energy, no offense. So is there anything 5G, 4G related where the state can come in, build a backbone, maybe a fiber backbone, and then deploy towers in our areas so that this need can be filled with wireless? Okay, well I'll, I'll say so Cellular services is very hard to impact. We don't, there are not a lot of cellular providers. Um, we are seeing more cellular providers that are starting to offer fixed service to households. So that'll be kind of interesting to see how that evolves. Um, I think, so I want to make a distinction between cell service versus fixed wireless because um, we do have a lot of fixed wireless providers out in, in this part of the state. So cellular um, as far as mobile service is not a part of these grant programs that we've talked about here um, we could look at building towers for fixed wireless but generally these programs are built are focused on fixed service to households and businesses but i agree that's something that needs to be addressed and um, i think that the fcc does have mobility funds which are a bit different don't come through the states but we'd be happy to um, get you some information on those. Very good. I'd like to ask uh, Representative Gillespie to come up here, also Representative Clampett and Representative Pless. If you guys make your way while they're coming up here, I recognize our Sergeant Arms, in case anybody got out of hand today, our Sheriff Robbie Holland back there. Robbie, wave at us. Appreciate you being here, Macon County Sheriff. Um, we're going, to, we're going to take a break in just a moment, but let me emphatically ask you, don't leave unless you have an emergency. We've got some really good stuff. Russ Harris is here with Southwest Commission. You want to know how to apply for your grants or you have questions about it, you need help with it, we're going to talk about that, okay? So we're going to give you direct information about that. Russ is going to talk to you. Don't leave. We're also going to hear from the providers. I want to recognize these guys. We've co-hosted this event together. If, if you're in one of those seven counties, or, or we'll say Transylvania too, if you're in this room, you're my constituent, okay? You're in my Senate district. These guys are your representatives. Carl represents Macon, uh, Graham, Clay, and Cherokee County. Mike represents Swain, Jackson, and a little piece of Haywood, oh, and- oh, just. Transylvania now. Just Transylvania now. Just now Transylvania. We're talking now. You don't represent No, 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 no. We're, we're just going to just wake up and smell the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> he does that we all know. He represents Swain, Jackson, and a little piece of Haywood. And may represent Transylvania. The House, the house members and the senators never correct each other. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it only takes one senator to counteract three House members. <laughs> and, and Mark represents uh, a large part of Haywood County and also takes in uh, Madison County. So these are your representatives. Carl is going to take 
Uh, the second part of the program uh, is going to be introducing our folks, but I want to let you know who your representatives are in case you want to talk to them. These guys are, are here for the day, okay? And thank you, by the way, for driving up from Raleigh. Do you know how far it is from Raleigh to here? Yeah. 313 miles. I can tell you exactly how far it is, right, Carl? So we appreciate you making this trip out here. They're going to be here, okay? So if you have questions, ask them at the break. This break is for several for several reasons. To let you stand up out of the metal chairs and stretch a little bit. Men's restrooms over here. There's several available places in there. And ladies, over here, there's restrooms in the back, but they're a single stall. But uh, over here are the ladies' room. In the back, uh, Nancy, Larry, uh, man, these folks have prepared uh, some food and beverages for you. you. Got coffee, water. So go back there and help yourself. Also, talk to the providers. And these guys are available at the break, and they'll be available after the meeting. And also, we're going to take some final questions at the very end. So we're going to take about a 15 minute break. And if you would, uh, just uh, make yourself at home here, help yourself to the refreshers. Please eat all. Carl and I bought all the food. And if you don't eat it, you've got to take it home, right, Carl? So uh, take a break. Thank you for being here. We'll be back at exactly 2.28. If you have not signed up on the pads that are going around the room, make sure we get your updated name and email address. We'll remind you of that again. Thank you. All right, thank you. Everybody, we find a seat. Let me remind you, there's a there's a couple of pads going around uh, that you can put your name. We want to make sure that when we have things like this, that my Senate office has your, or Carl and these guys have your correct name, address, uh, email, and those kind of things. Where are those pads? Anybody got the pads? Yep, here's one. There should be another one going around. Make sure you sign that before you leave and make sure we have your correct um, email. All right. Um, the young man that helped me put this together does a great job as a representative in uh, North Carolina. And uh, proud to call him my neighbor, my friend, Representative Carl Gillespie. Would you welcome Carl? Thank you, sir. Um, Kevin made mention of, of who put this together. I just want to echo that. Uh, if it had not been for his L.A., Cindy Hobbs, who's here, my L.A., Andrew Bailey, who's back in Raleigh, this, this, stuff like this doesn't just happen. They do a lot of hard work to make these things happen. Kevin and I get the opportunity to stand up here before you, but it's, you know, we're doing 10%, they're doing 90%. So if you would just give, give Cindy and Andrew a Also, Kim Corbin standing in the back. Kim, would you raise your hand, please? Thank you. We appreciate your work. The folks at Holly Spring Baptist Church, we thank them for, for providing this wonderful facility. Kevin Corbin has got to be one of the smartest and wittiest guys that I know. <laughs> but sometimes he forgets something. <laughs> so I would like to recognize Kevin's wife, my neighbor, previously Kevin's neighbor, <laughs> Beth Corbin. He forgot one time and Carl will not let it go. Thank you. No, I will not let it go. Um, members of the media, members of the media, if you could please stand. Without the media here getting the word out, uh, we, we wouldn't get the mileage that we need to get out of meetings like this. So thank you very much to the media. Um, I'd like to represent or re acknowledge a couple of gentlemen that I serve with, uh, Representative Clampett and Representative Pless. There's no two final gentlemen that serve in the North Carolina General Assembly. I appreciate y'all, appreciate you working with us. Thank you for being here. 
Um, you know, Kevin, this is Kevin's idea. Um, Kevin is a great leader. Kevin has a, he's, he's one of the best, even if he is a senator, one of the best at being able to look out at the landscape and see what the needs of the citizens are. Not just, that, that tells me he's a true public servant. And just thank you, Kevin, for all you do. Um, this time, I'd like to ask Russ with the Southwestern Commission to come up. Russ is going to talk to us a little bit about the Southwestern Commission, what they do, and what, what they're going to do in, in regards to broadband. Russ? All right. Good afternoon. My name is Russ Harris. I am the Executive Director of the Southwestern Commission. We are the Council of Governments for the far seven western counties, the towns within those counties, and the eastern band of Cherokee Indians. We work in three primary areas. Those are community and economic development, workforce development, and we work with our aging population to provide services to them. And we know an issue is important and critical when we start to run into that issue in all three of our departments. And broadband is one of those. We know it's important to our aging population with access to telehealth and services they need. We know it's important to workforce development. Um, we've talked about our students and the impact on them during COVID. And we know with attracting um, businesses to the region, we need to have access to internet for them as well. I may have thought I just disconnected. Um, so we started working on this about six years ago, and I give credit to my predecessor, Sarah Thompson, who had the vision to say this is a critical issue in our region and we're going to start working on broadband. And honestly, six years ago, we had no idea how we were going to start working on broadband. As Angie Bailey said, there was no fun at that point in time. So Sarah had the vision, and I remember the first time I told my kids, they said, what meeting are you going to? And I said, I'm going to a broadband meeting. And my older daughter, Ella, looked at me with scorn in her eye, and she said, we can't even get internet in our bedrooms. <laughs> so we've worked over this, you know, five years ago, we started by having a summit, and we brought in the Broadband Infrastructure Office to support that effort. We brought in elected officials, and it was just to share information, and as a region, we could start to learn a little bit about this issue, and what can government do when this is a private sector problem for the most part. These are private, unregulated businesses. So trying to figure out what we're going to do as a government was a little bit tricky. We followed that up with a survey. You know, we knew this was a problem, but until we could put numbers with the problem and actually know where the locations are, where we need to focus our efforts, then there's not much we can do. So we put out a survey, we started to get some numbers back, and you know, a lot of people said, well, what good does a survey do? Well, we use that survey then to work with providers to write $7 million in broadband grants that we were successful in getting that we brought into the region to expand that infrastructure. So that has been a, a lot of our focus over the last couple of years has been in that area. Going forward, we are looking at the digital inclusion and the digital literacy piece. You know, there's a quote out there that we have more people in the region with access to internet that don't take advantage of that than we do people without access to internet. So we have to start focusing on that side of the problem. So we are partnering with the Institute for Emerging Issues and Dogwood Health Trust to start doing digital inclusion plans in all our counties and we'll start that process in the next month so local government representatives our broadband committees will be reaching out to you to help us with that effort as we go forward the nice thing about that planning process is there will be money attached to that for each county to then turn around and do implementation so if we identify this area of this county we know these kids live up here and they don't have the devices they need that we can use money out of that um, for that county to then go buy those devices that are needed so we'll be doing that going forward and a lot of our you know our role is basically communication and trying to convene and pull people together we work with the broad broadband committees as angie bailey said we have probably more broadband committees certainly more active broadband committees than anybody else in the state sometimes they're more active than some people would like <laughs> every now and then i get a call George Collier works for the Broadband Infrastructure Office. He's over the grant program, and I'll have my phone ring, and I'll pick it up, and George will think he's talking to me, but anybody who knows George knows that it's possible he swallowed an amplifier as a child. So he, he's yelling at me about why are people in your region sending me so many emails? Um, and I think that's because we've been active, and we've been lucky, and that's one of the areas where we're lucky. I look out at all the elected officials we have here today, my board at the Southwestern Commission is made up of elected officials. So if our elected officials in the counties and towns didn't think this was an important issue, we wouldn't be working on this. So we're doing 
what their leadership provided us the space to do. So I thank them all for that. We're lucky to have them. Um, I think we have enough of you here today. We can actually call a quorum for our board meeting probably. Um, and then, you know, just also in wrapping up a little bit, we're lucky to have legislators that see this issue as important. That's also not true in every part of the state. And every one of them has seen this as an issue, has supported the funding of trying to solve this problem and supported us in that way. And then finally, you know, I think when we work with, sometimes when we work with agencies in Raleigh, there's a tendency to think, well, they don't understand this area. They don't know what we're going through. They don't respond to phone calls. And I'll say with the broadband infrastructure office, anybody that's worked with them knows that is absolutely not true with them. They answer the phone, they respond to your emails. Like I said, they call you sometimes when you don't want. Every now and then I'll get a call from Keith Connor and George Collier within 30 seconds of each other, and I'm in trouble. <laughs> um, but they are a partner. They know what the problem is out here, they know what the issues are, and they've been our partner every step of the way. So. Um, you know, we're here, we work for the local government, so if you're a local government member and, you know, you have questions, please reach out to me, come see me afterwards, I'll share my information. Uh, if you're a citizen, I'm happy to take calls too and just help you out any way we can. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. We're so fortunate in this part of North Carolina to have a Southwest Commission Thank you to you and your staff for the wonderful job that you do. If you're a service provider, come to the front of the room. We're going to line you all up up here. Everybody's, don't worry, you're only six bullets. Every person, so you probably won't get hit three times. So, so just, just for time's sake. A um, little bit about our service providers. Um, they're all in business. They all have a business model. They all have regulatory needs, requirements they have to meet. They would like nothing better than for all of us to have broadband, because then they can fill us off. <laughs> but but there's, there's a road that they have to travel to get from, we don't have internet, to everybody has internet. So we're not, we're not gonna take specific questions about why I don't have internet at XYD Street. These, these folks are gonna give us an overview of what they're working on and how that's gonna affect Asheville West. So start with who's a brave soul. Uh, if you just state your name, who you're with, and we'll give you about two minutes. Thank you. Bill Charlotte over River Street Networks. Uh, what we're excited about is the new funding opportunities. And uh, what we hope, and we think it's gonna be a big impact on you, are these new maps that they're working on. So we've got funding now that we gotta be looking at and working with the counties and the municipalities on uh, to make sure that we get as much of those funds out and in use as possible. I also worry about uh, take rate. And take rate is nothing more than the, than the household seeing the value of what these broadband can do for their household, especially if they have children in the household. It's just so critical, as you've seen through this process, having a Zoom meeting with 30 students and that uh, 29th student can't get on or because they don't have broadband or they gotta go to McDonald's to try to get on. It's just a difficult situation. We're not through with this thing called a pandemic. We're gonna see more of this activity and we gotta be ready for it. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having us here. It's great to see so many people excited about broadband. Thank you, uh, Senator Corbin Go and the representatives here. Uh, Y'all are represented very well in Raleigh. Uh, if I've not had a thousand conversations about broadband with any of them, I know somebody from our team has, so um, you're at least in, uh, in good hands with the folks here. Uh, I work for Charter Spectrum. We are in uh, a large part of the state, but we stop kind of around the Haywood area, have plans to go further west. Um, Y'all are probably familiar with Art Off by now, the World Digital Opportunity Fund. Uh, so that's something that we can talk to you. Uh, can't do that in two minutes probably here, but in any case, there's a lot of money out there between the state and federal programs. Um, the Bio, the Broadband Infrastructure Office here is also a great partner. Uh, they want to do the right thing. They're trying to help everybody out. 
it, it's complex and there's a lot of money and it unfortunately is going to take a little bit of time but we'll work together on this and uh, we'll, we'll see if we can make this go fast uh, we'll be interested in having stakeholder meetings there's a lot that goes into the process whether it's permits to roads permits for railroad crossings access to utility poles there's there's a lot to it but everybody has got the same goal and that's to get broadband here and we're just excited to work with you all on it so uh, if you all have any questions uh, mike tank from our team and i are, are available afterwards thank you my name is tony carter and um, i'm formerly with morris broadband i was with their general manager for 10 years and recently now, we've been purchased by Altima and Altis. You know, our role is twofold here. Uh, we also, not only to expand the rural markets, but also to maintain our customer base and, and provide reliable broadband to our current customers. When it was Morris, Morris spent a lot of money into the infrastructure to upgrade the current infrastructure so the current customers could receive uh, you know, reliable broadband service. Uh, just before COVID hit, we finished a, a $4 million infrastructure upgrade for Western North Carolina. And just after COVID hit, the bandwidth went up probably 40%. You all probably saw it too, went from up to here. But if the, the former infrastructure could only handle up to here. So our timing was great, our upgrade was great. At the same time, we also look, being a small regional provider, ways to creatively expand into rural areas. The Great Grand area is here. We got a Great Grand in Macon County. Uh, we did a creative agreement with WCU to expand in, in Jackson County, uh, which was over 700 and something underserved homes. Um, and as we began to focus on this, this is where Morris realized being a regional provider and looking at the need of the counties here, we need to turn the torch over to somebody else with larger capital. And that's when Altis and the Optimum purchase came into play. And fortunately, Altis uh, is ready to take that torch to the next level. Um, the day one after they uh, took over, they uh, sent probably three quarters of a million dollars spent walking out the whole county, both Macon and Jackson. And what they did is, when you walk it out, you're literally walking out over 400 something miles per county. You look at the poles, you measurement, and you take it back and you determine what your costs are and what your structures will be to expand in the rural areas. So we've got a lot of that data set forth and the, the great grant uh, you know, program is perfect. So now we're ready to set forward to put in a bunch of grant applications to go to the rural counties. As well as, you know, as soon as they took over, we began building our home in the southern part of Jackson County. So probably by the end of next month, we'll have over a thousand underserved homes with fiber to home. Um, so we're starting that fiber to home turn from the traditional service to fiber to home. And we'll continue that. Uh, we're excited about the grant program because all these homes that we'll be serving will be fiber to home like all the other providers. So all the people in the rural area will get the highest level of services that are available. And this is a, you know, as a provider, this is a one in a chance lifetime to come in and like you said, we want to serve everybody. And this is a great opportunity for all of us to serve. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon everybody. Thanks for being here. I'm Susan Miller with Frontier Communications and I feel sort of brave standing up here saying that. Um, my message to you is that Frontier has an entirely new senior leadership team at the highest level. Uh, we also have an entirely new leadership team at the local level, and I hope for those of you who have our telephone and, and existing internet service that you'll start seeing better service, uh, response rates to troubles and installs on the local level, that should have already been happening. Uh, I personally have seen fewer customer complaints, but that doesn't mean zero. Um, as part of the new leadership, and uh, we emerged from bankruptcy uh, earlier, about a year ago now, we have a lot of funding available for fiber build out and we are giving our north carolina western markets a really close look at what we can do here in western north carolina this is the first time in more than 12 years that i've seen the amount of capital made available to potentially serve our western north carolina market so for me that's a really positive message and i hope that everybody here will begin to see that frontier has become an active player and is interested in improving the service for our north carolina customers um, so that includes all the counties here with the exception of haywood frontier is not a traditional provider in haywood county but we also serve mitchell um, madison we serve parts of buncombe um, McDowell and and a few of the 
eastern North Carolina areas. So I just want to thank you for being here. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to uh, come and meet me. I want to call out, we have three other folks here from Frontier. If you could just briefly stand up. If you have any questions about existing service, future service, the four of us are more than happy to talk. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex King, and I'm the director of broadband at Blue Ridge Mountain EMC. Um, we are a electric cooperative uh, serving Cherokee and Clay County, and then three counties in northern Georgia. Uh, we're a little different provider uh, because we are a not-for-profit, so our main goal is to provide scalable and efficient broadband service to all of our members across the five counties that we serve. Uh, we have been very successful so far in obtaining grants. Uh, we are currently working on a great grant that we obtained last year. And uh, we actually, earlier this year, we finished all of the main line about 12 months early. And Angie Bailey and her team has been so helpful. I, I tell everybody that asks me about grants that the great grant is the best grant that we've worked on because it's so easy to administer and get reimbursements and everything and they're so helpful uh, but our goal is to chase all funding available and to get service to all of our members through our five counties and we're quickly working on obtaining that goal but again thank you all for being here and listening to all of us Hello, Jason Maples, Boston West. Um, some of you know us, uh, some of you may not. We are a collaboration, a partnership between the Eastern Band, the Cherokee Indians, and Drake Enterprises. Uh, we've been active. Um, both of those uh, anchor owners have plowed a great number of, of resources, money, time, and energy to solving broadband because they were a captor of it as well. Uh, we spent most of our formative years, uh, early years at, at Balsam West, developing uh, solutions for schools, libraries, county anchor institutions, businesses, large businesses, and even small businesses. About two and a half years ago, we got into the fiber of the home game uh, as an expansion of our business model. Um, we're roughly up to about 15 different individual communities, not on a larger scale community, cities, if you will. Uh, but uh, we've, we've learned a lot and we're growing rapidly. In fact, we've doubled our uh, employee base from that. So we're very proud of the progress we've made. We're very proud to partner with all of you to solve broadband. Um, in fact, uh, we just completed a uh, complete upgrade of our wireless infrastructure because fixed wireless is a product that we serve. Uh, in Macon County. So now we're able to uh, deliver 50 meg fixed wireless service to them, some of the most remote regions and continuing to scale and grow. So we look forward to continue to grow in our area with you and solving, help being part of solving the broadband problem. Thank you. Please join me in, in giving all these folks a hand. So, uh, I'm sure that you know each, each one of these providers have a little different angle. They, they have a little different perspective. They have a little different objectives. But the, the one thing that they all have is they have interest in western part of North Carolina. And I think that's, that's where we have value here is we have multiple providers that are willing to look at things differently to get to the end product of all of us having affordable broadband. So I want to just thank them for coming and be willing to stand up here and be shy at it. Every day that didn't happen, so I was happy there. Uh, so just thank you to everybody for coming. I hope, I hope you find this informative. I encourage you to mingle. Most of the folks that got up here and spoke are still here. Talk to them if you got some ideas. You want to ask some questions? Now's, now's a great time to do that. So, with that, Sir Gordon. Thank you, Carl. I promise you at the end, uh, so Nate, if you need, we'll come back up in just a minute. If you guys have some general questions for them, I believe in starting on time, I believe in quitting on time. So, I'm going to try to get us out of here pretty close to three. Uh, again, these guys are going to hang around. 
uh, for as long as, as you need to. Also, the providers are here. You know who your providers are. Uh, and very quickly, I did not recognize the Eastern Band. I didn't think I wanted to hear, but I think we do have some folks from the Eastern Band of the Cherokees. Are they still here? Yes, sir. Thank you. Stand up, sir. <laughs> Mr. Jeremy Brown, I happen to know him. Good guy. Uh, and also, uh, Lisa is with Duke Power. Do you have anything to share with us today from Duke? I know there's oftentimes lots of frustrations with you, but we will all get through this because the greater good is for the citizens of Western North Carolina. So, thank you. And I think you guys have noticed, we've invited all the players. Anybody that has anything to do with internet or anything to do is here. They're all in the room. At the same time, I don't think this has ever been done before, but uh, we're glad to be the first. If you've got a, another question of these guys, uh, and Cindy's waving at me, what about signing up for the? Yeah, if you did not get your name on that white pad, if you if now if you got your if you got your email and everything's good, they don't need to do anything, right? But if you need to change something, add something, give us a new email right there. There's one of them. There's another one somewhere. Hold it up. The second one. Hold it up. There we go. In the back. So if you've not done that, please do it. All right, final questions. Somebody? Yes, sir. Is there a reason why I haven't heard any of the satellite companies that a lot of us are forced to use and they are not the best service out there? They're not here. I didn't hear anybody from any of them. Is there a reason for that? Are they included in the program? <laughs> satellite service is not included in the it currently in the two programs that we described today. And I think I mentioned that the, the federal guidance requires speeds that are largely focused on fiber deployments, right? There is, uh, I believe in the state budget, we got a million dollars state funding, so not tied to those federal speed requirements, for our rate grant program to, uh, to basically adapt and include grant funds for satellite providers to try and get more engagement from low orbit satellite providers here. But that's not included yet in what we talked about today. Okay. And I, I can't speak for their presence or absence. <laughs> yes, sir. Senator, first, thank you. Thank everyone who put this together. Phenomenal program. Is your presentation available? That whole slide that we uh, They said they can email it to you. So if you'll I think we've left their contact. So ncbroadband.gov. Make sure your office has that. Yes, if you'll, uh, if you, all of you have a, uh, I think you have one of my cards. If you, uh, my card, I think the email, send you some email on here. Yes, kevin.corbin at ncleg.gov. If you'll email us, we'll email you this. Yeah, we'll take care of that. Just one of my cards is on your table there. Okay, other questions? Anybody? Yes, yes, ma'am. I have a question just purely out of ignorance, but is there assigned service areas for broadband providers? No. Can, so no, can, you talk, mean, can you talk about how the community could find out, I know it goes back to your map, but how the community could find out who that might be? So there's not a sign, there's traditional, you know, kind of voice and eyelet footprints that generally uh, broadband providers can go wherever it's not regulated. Um, but on those maps that we showed, the, NC, the nc1map.gov slash broadband, on the broadband planning maps, you can actually, if you click on a county, you can see what providers are in that county and see the footprints. Thank you. Okay. Good question. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Yes, in the back. Are you running fiber optics or are you going to make us 
I'm happy to yield the mic to any provider that wants to do that. In the, in the, well, there's one. In the meantime, that, that was not a competitive bidding process for the record. In, in the meantime, I'd like to ask Keith, who does a lot of our kind of constituent outreach on that, to come find you and help with that. Okay, I think someone's in the process of answering that question. Anybody else have anything? One, one last question. Yes, ma'am. We're asking for the phone number for the survey for those who don't have internet access. Crystal Dickinson uh, has it right here and we will read it all. We need a snappy letter thing. 919-750-0503. And we'll make sure this is included in the information that we send to the Senator's office, so you can each get that directly. 919-750-0553. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Well, thanks again to uh, Representative Gillespie for helping put this program together. Carl, thank you. Appreciate your friendship. Appreciate the job you do. And Mike Clampett in the back. Thank you, Mike, for being a part of this. Representative Clampett and Representative Pless. Thank you. That concludes our meeting. Stick around as long as you'd like. God bless and have a great afternoon.